Hello, welcome to the Comic Book Club. I am your host, Jamil C, and with me today, as always, is my co-host in this madness that I decided to create for myself. Amanda, you call me hard. I'm doing all right. I'm. I I don't I don't think you're that mad. I think you're uh I think you're just paying attention. You know. All right. So Amanda, we are talking. Um, it, well, we are continuing Alice Ross month, and we are talking Marvels today. But I think there's some news and some TV shows we should talk about before we get to that. Yeah. And yeah, there's some there's some fun stuff going on. Yeah, some fun stuff, not so fun stuff. So let's <laughs> let's get the heavy thing out the way first. Um, uh, we were just talking about there's been this hoopla in comic Twitter, if there's such a thing about comic piracy. Could you explain to people what's going on here? Uh, yeah, so ever since we started having comics, well, actually, even before we started having comics available digitally, um, people were getting copies of comic books online, and, you know, you can just download them without paying, and uh, that kind of bypasses the market where not only companies and creators are getting paid, but also the market where the statistics are collected about how popular things are. And uh, every now and then on Twitter, a creator will realize that their book that got canceled was incredibly popular for download, and they'll get frustrated that they weren't being paid and that their book got canceled, and they will blame the fans for pirating the comics. Um, I personally feel like this is... I mean, this is an issue that all media has, right? Like, movies get pirated, music gets pirated. Um, but I think that in comic books, I think the direct market makes it hurt a little bit more. Um, because we've also had creators complain about, oh, if you don't pre-order my book, it's going to get canceled. So it isn't even just you're downloading the book online after I've made it it's if you don't buy the book before I've even written it I'm not going to get paid to write it um so I feel like the creators are being attacked on two fronts there and it's not like a direct attack from a person it's like a the system really sucks and they're doing the best they can um but it's also kind of bullshit to blame your fans so what do you what is your take on this this situation Okay, so as a person that used to use Napster back in the day, um, no, <laughs> no, I mean I we're both that age. Like before, it was easy to get music whenever, wherever you wanted. That was just the easiest way to do it. It wasn't even a moral thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I'm gonna tell you like this. What I find is people who steal shit was gonna steal it regardless. Like a lot of times, what I find with with people who pirate stuff, they were never gonna pay for it anyway like you're straight up that's the honest to god truth like like they just wasn't they, they were never going to pay for it they wasn't even going thinking about paying for it so like is it even fair to count them as like a missed sale if there was if they were never going to pay for it i think some percentage of I, this and this i'm not going to say it's oh. significant but i think there is some percentage of oh no definitely definitely i like, 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 it's complicated, right? You know what I'm saying? Well, and there's also, I think, I think there's also a few examples where, um, you know, books that are harder to find, people definitely pirate. Definitely, definitely. But, um, Look. no, I agree with you that most of the people who are pirating comics weren't, I mean, if they weren't going to download them off the internet, they're the guys who walk into the comic book store read a copy while they're in the store and then put it back on the shelf <laughs> yeah no no look look it definitely hurts i'm I'm not gonna lie like you know digital music pretty much pretty much has decimated the music industry right mm -hmm. like 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 even now like even with all the rules and regulations like access to music is so easy and so devalued at this point you know what i'm saying that Artists rarely make rarely make money off music. Like you know, when we're shoot, like when we were kids, we talk about when we were kids, right? You you remember like when NSYNC would sell two million copies, you know, in um 
in a week. You know, I remember like back in 97, 98, a uh, Lance Moore said sold 33 million copies off one CD. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you, 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 that doesn't happen now. You know what I'm saying? It just doesn't, you know. By the way, she has a, she, she, she's doing a jagged little pill, like 25th anniversary tour. I'm going. Oh, I'm going. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but like, yeah, so like, so like to say it doesn't have an effect, clearly it does. And like, the coming industry is so small, I could see why, but at the same time, you know, I've been there. Like, when I first started reading comments, and I was like a 13, 12, 13 year old kid, I couldn't afford that shit all the time. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I used to steal the shit. Like, just straight up, I used to steal it. I used to go into the bookstore and stuff two or three trades down my pants and walk the fuck out. Now, of course, when I, when I started making my own money and stuff, I I pay, I, I, you know, I started paying for all my stuff. And as we know now, that has clearly got out of the hand because I spent way too much money on comments. So, like, I've been on both sides of this argument. But what I find is they was going to these sites and looking at the counter. Like, you know, they was trying to, like, quantify it where it says 90,000 people read this. This 90,000, like, sales I didn't make. Like, I don't think that's true. I think a lot of times those are bots and, like, and, like, a few people who wasn't going to buy it anyway. I don't think it was all people who are going to, like, steal it. Then it also, like, there's also, like, a study going around that says that people who pirates actually goes back and pay for stuff later. Mm, interesting. Like, you know, like, you know, they might, they, they might get an issue. They, they they might pirate an issue for free to yeah. see if they like it. Then they'll go back and pay for it. Again, this doesn't excuse any of this. That's not what I'm saying. But I think it's a lot more complicated than just, you know... Then it's just people stealing. No, I I agree because there's like, you know, like at the base moral level, like, yeah, stealing is wrong. Um, But also yelling at your fans, blaming them. You know, it it doesn't endear you. It doesn't endear you. Like, you can talk about it, but like to actually yell and say, you taking food out my family's mouth. I like I don't know that that it seemed like a I know like none of these people are rich, but like also you 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 you're a person and you, and like we were all that age and we all done things, so you should have better understanding to just than to just yell at your fans. You know what I'm saying? Well, and this is also I frequently said that the problem with comic the comic book industry is that because they don't have offices, this shit happens on Twitter. So you've got to imagine that if all of these people, all of these creators and editors were in a building together and could just hang out in the break room and shit talk people and be like, oh, my gosh, like, can you believe the piracy numbers and blah, 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 and that they could get angry in a safe environment? That would be fine. That sort of thing happens everywhere. But because comic books are aren't a place and it kind of happens like on Twitter in public, we get to see the dirty laundry that happens in every other industry, but it's, it's just out there and the fans get to engage with it. There's no reason for that. That's why I don't like Twitter. Look, like I think a really good example is that big movie, like movie stars have to deal with negative reviews all the time. Right. But instead of them going on Twitter and, like, vanity searching their name and yelling at people, like, they probably just do it in real life in their house or, like, with their agent or, like, you know, at work. Twitter isn't the place – like, the like what I'm saying is that the feelings are normal and that the pressure valve is necessary, but that having it be on Twitter by default is so weird. I mean, there's just the age we live in, Amanda. But other like other industries don't do that. Mm, like, music, music, music people tend to do that. Maybe not about piracy, but about other shit. Look, the, Twitter is just terrible. Okay, it gets so many mm-hmm. people in trouble. Look what happened to Kevin Hart, right? Like it just gets. Look what happened to James Gunn. It just gets so many people in trouble. Yeah. 
it's just a cesspool of just the worst. But yeah, you're right. You're right. It, it doesn't. It, it, it it's just not a good look. You know. In fact, there's a good chance that more people might pirate it just because you know people are saying so much about it. Mm-hmm. This I don't know. Yep, that's my thought. I, I think it's complicated. I don't think you should be yelling at your fans. And honestly, all this might be Comixology fault. Yeah. Because, um, you notice most of the people that was complaining about this are people from, like, smaller comic companies or mm-hmm. people who go through Image, right? Mm-hmm. You know on Comixology... You, like 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 for like image and like the smaller companies, you can actually download a backup. Marvel and DC won't let you do that on there, right? But you can download a backup. So the question is like, where the hell are they getting these digital files? Clearly, this shit is coming from Comicsology. Yeah, like they, they they get such crisp and clean files of it. You know what I'm saying? Clearly, a lot of this is just you know coming through there. And I don't want to say nothing disparaging about Comixology because I don't want it to go away because I don't know what the hell I would do if Comixology went away. But I feel like a lot of this has come through Comixology. That is a good point because when I started out saying that, oh, you know, like before we even really had digital comics, I remember somebody gave me a flash drive that had lock and key on it. Uh huh. Um, and I could barely read it because it was pretty much like somebody took – like potato camera photos of each page was like what the, what the digital comic was. And um, then I would get every now and then I would get to an issue that looked like it had come from like an actual scan, but it was, it was clear that I was not meant to be reading it that way. Uh, So you're right. Part of it is, you know, once, once Comixology is making the raw data available like that, um, and you know people expect to be able to read it that way. I mean, look, look, it, it's it's other things too. Like um, even other bit too, you could take a screenshot if you wanted to. Like a mm-hmm. lot of a, a lot of the thumbnails that we have for this show, right? Yeah, are just thumbnails off off, off the cover <laughs> that I took <Yeah. laughs> and just uploaded it. You know what I'm saying? So like uh, so. Like there's, but there's, a lot of those images are also like that's the same. That's the same as what Diamond would have as the preview for the book, right? Or as what Wikipedia would have for the the entry for that book. Sometimes no, I'm talking about from the direct comic that I'm reading. Sometimes I'm I'll... saying I'm saying that's how you got the image, but like there is a legit source for them. Yeah. But I'm just saying, like, but if somebody wanted to screenshot a whole comic... For a whole book, yeah. They could. What, that, that's 33... Well, a comic is, what, 22 pages? So there's mm-hmm. 22 screenshots. And you can... And it'll be a nice... It'll be close to high res. And you can upload that. Mm-hmm. So, like... Uh, so unless you're going to get rid of digital comics, you're just going to have to be smart about it. Because I, I don't think digital comics are going anywhere. Yeah. All right, I think we've exhausted that. I don't. Is there anything else you want to add, Amanda, to that? Um. No, no. Just um, I guess reminder to everybody: if you've pirated a book and you really liked it, and you want to read more of it, maybe consider buying the trade or something. Right, at least the trade. But like, if you just pirate one issue, maybe thinking about buying the second issue. You know what I'm saying? Just no. No, everybody everybody can do better. All right. So, Amanda, you want to, what else did you want to, you want to talk about um this crazy CW thing that's about to happen? Yeah, I I don't watch a lot of the um superhero shows, but it's difficult to not be aware of the fact that they're doing the uh Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline for like the CW Supergirl Flash uh I guess At- there's also Green Arrow, Batwoman. And and Black Lightning. Okay, yeah. Um, and I've just kind of vaguely been aware of some of the casting and that they've done some kind of fun uh, fourth wall breaking stuff for us. I heard that um, that we get Kevin Conroy, who's been the voice of Batman in the co- the animated series. 
that he's actually going to be Batman on screen? No, I mean, he's going to be no. Kingdom Come Batman. <gasps> oh, and then Brandon Ruth, who was Superman in Superman Returns, is going to be Kingdom Come Superman? Yes. <laughs> oh, my God, that was loud. That Sorry, was loud. that was that was the um, <laughs> white girl noise. That was the woo girl noise that, that happens when we talk about fan casting and or when I've had, like, an entire margarita. <laughs> Those are the two things that, that get me to woo girl status. So, and, like, if you've seen the picture, it's Kevin Conroy in, like, the exoskeleton suit, like in Kingdom Come, like, like in Kingdom Come. I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> and, yeah, Brandon, you know what, man? Brandon Roth looks so good in that damn suit. It's a shame we didn't get more movies with him. Like you know, I, I, I feel like we about to have the same problem with Henry Cavill. Where like 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 in like a couple of years when he's not Superman no more, and we mm-hmm. look at Henry Cavill, we're gonna be like, damn, we <laughs> they ain't do right. I feel like the last couple of Supermans they ain't done right by. I, I let me put it that way. Yeah. I, I think I think Henry Cavill, who has nothing to do with this conversation, and Brandon Ralph are. Are great Supermans. They look the part. They sound the part. You know what I'm saying? They just the movies they were in was, wasn't just that great. But that really has nothing to do with them, per se. Yeah. And Brandon Ralph was was was, was a good Superman to me, and it, and it's a shame that he never got to play it. So it, it's nice to see that this is some redemption. I I mean they yeah I just I just love that they acknowledge that he's he's a great Superman, and that for us to have him come back as Superman is, is kind of exciting. Um, the costume has like the black S too, and he's yes. like a tiny bit gray and it's just, it's very cool. Well, you know, it's funny too, because like they have a regular Superman in that universe, right? Mm-hmm. And he just towers over that Superman. That's fun. J- no, just, just the idea that it's like, you know, I, I guess, I guess they didn't appreciate how big Brandon Routh was then. No, Uh, because I thought the guy that they cast for Superman was pretty big too. No, no, he towers over that guy. He's a good four or five inches taller than that guy. Oh my goodness! Look, find the picture. Look, you'll see. Like, like he is, he is way taller than dude, and it's just like, oh man. And I thought dude was a pretty good Superman, but then to see him next to (laughs) Ralph, you just like, oh, this, this is, this is no comparison right here. You know what I'm saying? This is. This isn't even this this isn't even fair or close. Oh yeah, this is this is like me standing next to my husband. This is this is crazy. <laughs> but it's but it's so great because they do both they do both look like Superman. High cheekbones, piercing blue and eyes. yeah, and their their costumes are both great. And yeah, that's that's so much fun for them to like. I mean, it gets better because Tom Welling is in the show too. Is going to be in there too. Was he the Smallville one? Yes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So they're just they're just giving us everything we could have possibly wanted, Bert, but Bert, on television Bert instead Ward of on... is in here. Yeah. Yes. You you, you know what? Yeah, Burt Ward. Um, uh, Linda Carter's supposed to be popping up. Supposedly, they ain't say who she's playing, but I'd be goddamn if she ain't fucking like an older version of Wonder Woman of some sort. Yeah, I'm. I'm very, I'm very excited for them. I'm, I'm just so confused as to why this is a television event and not the. Why isn't this the Batman versus Superman movie? I, I mean, why is this the Snyder cut? Huh, no, we not even. You know what? Maybe it's that what I wanted to talk about is the Snyder Cut. No, we didn't want to talk about it. We didn't want to talk about the Snyder Cut. No, it's not even a thing. <laughs> I we want to talk about pink elephants? I don't know, man. I I only watched the first two seasons of Arrow and like the first three three seasons of Flash, and I dropped off. Right, so I haven't watched any of these shows. You know, I just there's not enough time in the day to watch all this damn TV. And they're good shows, but they're not great. So I don't have I don't have enough time for good shows. But this is supposed to be spanning across five different series over a week time. I'm watching every episode. Okay. 
I'm watching every they 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 they, they, they hooked me. They they hooked me. As soon as I heard Kevin Conroy, it wasn't even that Brandon Roth was playing Superman. When I heard Kevin Conroy is playing Bruce Wayne in live action, I was hooked. I was like, well, you got me. There we go. The only thing I'm hoping for is with Arrow mm -hmm. is that um what's his name? Stephen DeMille. They give him like a, a goatee and a mustache. <laughs> Because, like, the, that's the one thing that's been missing from his Green Arrow, in my opinion. Okay. It's, it's, it's the Van Dyke beard and mustache combination. But, yeah, so, yeah, that's Crisis on Infinite Earth. Who do you think is going to die? Everybody. Everybody's going to die. Like, somebody has to die because, you know, it's famous, you know, Crisis on Infinite Earth is famous for killing Flash and Supergirl. Mm-hmm. But since Flash and Supergirl got hit shows, I doubt if they're dying. So I'm thinking it's probably going to be Green Arrow since this show just ended. Yeah. So I'm thinking it's going to be him. That's probably going to like be offed. So yeah, that's um, Crisis on Infinite Earth. Um, so before we get into Marvels, there's one more thing I want to talk about. Watchmen. Okay. Not the book. Not Alan Moore like musings on it. But I'm talking about Watchmen the TV series. Okay. Amanda, Watchmen the TV series, and I'm just not saying this because I love comic books, because as I told you, I don't watch a lot of comic book shows. Yeah. Watchmen the TV show is the great, is the best show on TV right now. Okay. There's nothing better than Watchmen right now. It's um, it's well written, well executed, and 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 it's by far and like. This may actually deter people because this might be a problem. It's the blackest show on TV. Okay. If they keep at this rate, this might be a better Watchmen than the actual comic. Interesting. That's how. Okay. That's how good. It is. I mean, look. I'll, you see, it's hard to talk about because I don't want to spoil anything. Okay. But it, it, it's a Watchmen universe. It is it is based after the comic, not the movie, and it takes place thirty years after the events. Thirty five after the events of the comic. After the after the giant square hit Manhattan. This takes thirty five years later in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Actually the show a lot of it is about white supremacy and how corrosive it is and how and how how it can get in any type of government and stuff. And like this show is brilliant. Everybody says so. It, like 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 this is just not a me thing. This is like it's critically acclaimed from 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 it's critically acclaimed. The audience love it, but it's it's had low ratings. And I think okay. I know why. And I don't want to bring race into this, but I think it had may have something to do with just Amer America's complete apathy towards black people and slavery. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. It's not fun to think about. Well, no, it's funny because um, Jack brought this to my attention. Um, we we I was reading we was reading articles about it. Like, why isn't nobody watching Watchmen? We was watching YouTube videos about it. Why nobody's watching watching Watchmen? And like, you know, it's all these well-meaning white people, but they kept dancing around the reason. They 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 kept giving other reasons, but never like what's probably the real reason for it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is. This is something that comes up on movies and stuff sometimes, which is that things can be technically good, but not enjoyable to watch. Do you think it falls into that category? No, or do no, you really no, think it's... no. This show is enjoyable. Like, it, it can be funny sometimes. It, 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 it's not, but, like, it does confront you with these issues that nobody wants to talk about. But okay. it's, it's, it's done in a pop, like, comic book type of way. It's not like it's preaching to you. You know what I'm saying? It's a bunch of cops running around in masks beating up a bunch of um, white supremacists in masks. Like... <laughs> Okay, I mean, that sounds pretty cool to me. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, like, you know, but, like, a big chunk of the cast is black. You know what I'm saying? The main character is black. The, um, like, like and, like, there's just a lot of this, like, going on. And nobody's watching this show. And, like I said, it's not preachy because God knows me and you had this conversation. I hate shit like that. I can't stand shit like that. I hate woke shit. 
like like anything that's like woke for the for 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 like pats on the back. Mm-hmm. I can't stand. It's like the um, it's like the woman scene in, in Avengers Endgame, right? You know what I'm saying? I've I've talked to yeah. several. I talked to yeah, several women. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a little bit like, oh hey, like you know, <laughs> somebody somebody from like management came in and interfered and put it in there because they heard that someone wanted it. Yeah, you just roll your eyes. You know what I'm saying? Did someone say, well, if you roll your eyes at that scene, obviously you don't like women. Like, no, it's not that. It's just like, and she was a bit cheesy. There's like, like, can you imagine if they did that while the black superheroes got together and, <laughs> <laughs> and protected Spider-Man? <laughs> yeah. Like Falcon and fucking Black Panther <laughs> and Shiri. Just all the black hero War Machine. <laughs> We got this son, and then it's like, no, that's that's terrible. But no, the show is not like that. <laughs> it's not like that at all. But like, it does. Like the show, like I said, we talked about this. The show opens up with block with Black Wall Street. A lot of people didn't know about Black Wall Street. A lot of people, some a lot of black people didn't know about Black Wall Street, let alone white people. So like, you know, when 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 the premise of your show is kind of based after like this one giant. This one piece of giant trauma, you know what I'm saying? It just, it seems to be, it it seems to rub a lot of people the wrong way. And I just don't mean like racist people either. I just think, look, America ain't never cared care about what it did to black people, despite it, the lip service paid to it, right? But the whole country is just built on apathy towards like it, it the most terrible shit that it's ever done, right? Yeah. Like you know what I'm saying? Like 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 you like you ever heard about Germany where like like it, like there's nothing Nazi related. You can't even have video games that have Nazi shit in it. Like like you have to like you have to change your video game because they are ashamed. They they had to pay reparations to those Jewish people. They had to do all this shit to make right for some shit they did eighty years ago at this point, right? Yep. But America would never do that. Like America would never do that. They would never be ashamed of it. <laughs> I mean, I agree with you. I also think that part of the difference is that when the Civil War ended, America didn't sign like an armistice. It, it, it was it was an agreement with itself. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's so part like of it. if we if we'd lost a war against someone else it may have been easier to enforce those things. Like, I think that if you came into Germany a hundred years later and asked them to start changing, it would be, I guess what I'm saying is this is just an argument for as soon as you do something wrong, you need to start correcting it. What, 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 because what? otherwise you get like this sort of built in apathy you're pointing out. Well, no, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, I shit, I watched Ken Burns' documentary on, like, all 800 hours of it. Motherfuckers didn't care about black people. They they were just happy this shit was over with. Both sides. Like, oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> and they just found other ways to, like, subjugate people. And no one cared, as long as they wasn't technically slaves. But, like, what happens is that, you, you like I said, you grow that apathy. And, like, this show confronts that and is about that. But it's not in the priest. Like I said, it, it's very much in an entertaining comic book type of way. But it does confront that. It, it's, it's racism through the eyes of comic books in the best way possible. And, like, it, it's a shame nobody's watching. But I heard it's doing better. I heard word, word of mouth is getting around now. But I think it's a shame nobody's watching Watchmen. Because I think we all should be watching it. Because I think it's the best show on TV. All right. Well, <laughs> well, if if I can get over my uh, my apathy towards actually sitting Amanda, in one stop. place and oh. and watch it for long enough. Sorry, I just I just fall asleep early these days. I watch it the next day. <laughs> that Amazon. good? Huh? It's that good? Look, look, I, look. I'm I I, I fall asleep early too because I'm old. So, and it comes on at nine, and it's almost too late. So, I I actually watch it like like that Monday morning. So, but yeah, no, no, you're right, you're right. I think, I think you should watch it, Amanda. I think you would love it. Okay. 
you personally, I think you and your husband will probably love it. So, with that being said, let's talk about Marvels, written by Kurt Busiek and drawn by Alex Ross. Cause that's surprise. Alex. I know, right? <laughs> It also says created by both of them. Like, what I find with Alex Ross stuff, and this is the same thing with Kingdom Come, Alex Ross is not just, like, the painter. Like, he's actually the ideal man behind a lot of this stuff. So, a lot of the times, he brings on, like, a good writer to flush out, like, ideas that he had. Yeah. Like, you know, I've read the sequel of Kingdom Come, where it's just Mark Waid and not Alex Ross. Guess what, Amanda? What? Not that great. Not <laughs> that great. Mark, Mark Way is, is, is one of the best comic book writers in the world, but trying to follow that up and yeah. like not having Alex Ross' input, not that great at all. So yeah, today we are talking Marvels. Published January 1994. It, it ran from January 1994 through April 1994. It won several Eisner Awards, including Best for Night Series, Best Painter for Alex Ross. Best... Look, it won a lot of stuff, okay? It won a lot. Yeah, of, everything. It won everything. So what? What? What I didn't realize is this. This was actually he. He actually did this before Kingdom Come. In my mind, Kingdom Come always came first because maybe that's the first thing I read. Okay. So, so Amanda, what do you think of Marvels? Um. So, I I did really enjoy this. Um. I felt like. I felt like this compared to the other Alex Ross books we've read, this felt more like a traditional comic book in terms of its layouts. Yeah. Um, And I feel like that may be somewhat because this entire book seems to be very closely inspired by specific other Marvel stories. So in addition to photo reference, I think Alex Ross is probably referencing existing traditional comic books um, when he was putting it together. I will say that after reading Kingdom Come, the sort of frame story we have here of a journalist going, you know, through, through the course of his life um, kind of on the periphery of everything going on with the superheroes, it feels a lot like the same device that he used in Kingdom Come with the priest. Yeah. Uh, I was just kind of like, really? Like, I guess I guess someone just said, hey, do Kingdom Come for Marvel now? And he did his best. <laughs> well, no, it was all the way around because this came first. Really? Yeah, this came first. Kingdom Come came out in 96. This came out in 94. Okay, well, in that case, someone said, do Marvels, but better for Kingdom Come. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, it, it felt... Um, yeah, it felt a little derivative after Kingdom Come. Well, what I find funny is that it's there's not a lot of superheroes in this superhero book. Did you notice that? Yeah. Like, as opposed to Kingdom Come, where there's nothing but superheroes, you get very few glimpses of superheroes in, in this comic. Yes. Because it's more about him than it is the superheroes. While Kingdom Come had that device, it's, it's clearly more about Superman than it was about the preacher. Yes. Uh, so like, like we just get a simple premise of like this is about a guy who's basically goes to what the first twenty five years of Marvel. Like basically, this is the Marvel universe if it happens in real time, right? Yes. So like you know, so like Captain America got froze in forty five, but he got unthawed in sixty four by Iron Man. Yep. So unlike uh, so unlike uh, most comic books, this is not a sky, it's not a sliding um, timeline. Right. The characters are actually aging, and there are consequences of previous encounters. Um, although it is really interesting that one of the one of the frustrations that the main character has is that it feel he says it feels like the people around him don't really like remember what's happened like (laughs) like one week they're angry at the superheroes because of some perceived slight 
And then like the next week they like love them again. And it feels like some of his frustration is just like, like, Hey, pick a way to feel about how the world has changed and stick with it because otherwise you're going to be ungrateful and hypocritical. Um, and obviously, you know, as, as this is, this is coming at some level from Alex Ross, um, the side that the, the point of view that it comes down on is that you should appreciate your superheroes. Well, you know, it's very funny because this is very much how the Marvel universe operates. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, since, since, since Marvel take place in a more realistic version, like, you know, in DC, the, the, the crowd tends to worship their heroes in yeah. Marvel. We, we they they'll spin the hero face as much as they as much as they'll cheer them depending on the day. So it's funny that he actually brought that within like the context of the story. You know. What yes. I mean? Yes. <laughs> so, um, what, what I think it does real good is just to show you how scary this shit is when you're a regular person. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I found it interesting that. One of the first conflicts is that um, the main character, it's Phil, right? Yeah. Um, the photographer, Phil, he, when, the, when um, the, first, the first two superheroes we got were the Human Torch and uh, Namor. Yeah. Um, sorry, Namor. Um, Namor. Namor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm like allergic to this name right now. Um <laughs> The sexy guy with the pointy ears who's not Spock. Yeah, just to see, like, like giant waves crashing over the city. Just to see, like, because, like, like these are actual, a, a lot of the stories in here are actual, like, famous comic book stories, right? And yeah. like, But it's just told from, like, you know, the, the point of view of the crowd. And it's fucking terrifying, right? Like, to see Galactus just come out the sky. And like the sky is on fire, and to see the silver surfer come with a bunch, come with like a meteor shower, like in the middle of Manhattan, and it's just like, oh, I piss myself. Like you know, you you always get the view from like the superheroes, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, this shit looks awesome. Yeah. But if you're just a guy on the street and you you have no answers, and there's nothing you can do, it's just like, it's just a very helpless feeling, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I'll also like to bring up that, like, uh, the co-star of this book, um, J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> and, uh, Ben Ur, uh, Ben Urich? I can't Ur do names at the moment. It, ben Urich. Like... Ben Urich, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, he's, uh, he's sometimes in Daredevil books, right? Yes, he is. Yeah, lots of, lots of little cameos from, um from established characters hey, you know and it's weird because his, his relationship with, with with like with like um jane jonah jj mm -hmm. it's weird because like it's not like they best friends but they seem close at the same it's weird right like uh jj definitely respects him more than he respects peter parker for sure but, um, but like, like he showed up at the hospital and shit. Like, like it's mm -hmm. weird. It's it, like it's like that friend you have that's kind of like the friend of a friend. Like y'all like real cool, but like y'all don't necessarily hang out together by yourselves. <laughs> yeah. But you got hurt, so they feel obligated to come see you. <laughs> so I, 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 so that's what it seemed like. I don't know, but like I just thought they were. Like, but yeah, he definitely respects him more than he does. Um. And we get to see him young when he's smoking a cigarette with no mustache, but mm -hmm. it's still clearly him because he still got the fucking high top fade. Like, like he still yeah. has the hair. So that's how you know it's J. That's how you know it's JJ. Yeah. Um. So to get back to what I was trying to say before, I found it a little bit surprising that Phil's reaction to the appearance of the the first superheroes, um, was to break off his engagement with his wife. Yeah. Um, because I, I guess he felt like if he couldn't protect her from the superheroes, he had no right marrying her and starting a family. Dumbest shit I ever heard in my life. 
Yeah, yeah, that is that is dumb to the level of like, you know, had me like I can't have sex with you because I'm a senator. Like that makes no sense, George Lucas. Like, what are you thinking? Um, if anything, I would I would expect that having an existential threat like that would make them get married faster. Right. Like the world is ending. We need to get married now. Now, now if, if, if the thing was like they got married, but they didn't want to have kids because of that, that would have made more sense and been more interesting. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like, yeah. And then she ended up pregnant and he just like, ah, oh, shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That would have been more interesting. But what the fuck do we know? We on the podcast. So. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so um, ah, I, I don't even know where to like, you know, we we, we we jumping around all all around the place here, but like, well, I think it's it's interesting to to follow Phil's path from being first believing that he can't get married because they're superheroes, <laughs> and then he, um, you know, comes to see that you know actually maybe they are quite heroic. But still having a bias against mutants specifically. Which is something I always bring up, which is fucking weird. Like, over the years, I've seen Marvel several times trying to reconcile these two things. Mm -hmm. And this, just like just like every other time, I'm, I'm never convinced of. Yeah. They didn't make, any, they, they didn't make a lick of sense. You like the human torch, but somehow a motherfucker with wings scare you. I like that don't make any sense. To, like. Well, especially since there are even X Men who have like the same power as the human torch. Essentially, like they can light stuff on fire. It's really s silly to me that you know the android human torch isn't can 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 achieve a reputable. Uh, reputation um that's a horrible way to put it but uh that he can be loved and then a mutant who starts fires wouldn't be yeah um but when it, phil's daughters try to help a mutant girl he like changes his mind <laughs> um and he he also has an encounter with the x-men where he hears cyclops say that humans aren't worth it um, and he, he sort of comes to a different understanding, sort of an evolution. Um, and finally, like one of the last bits of his story is that he, um, that is that he wants to defend Spider-Man's reputation. Yeah. Um, and that he actually seeks out Gwen Stacy and wants to write an entire book about how essentially Spider-Man didn't do it. Spider-Man didn't kill uh, her yeah. father. Um, and it's just, I mean, I feel like that's like the most, the, that's the closest thing we have to a through line in this book. Right. And it's still not entirely satisfying. Um, it is weird how he flips between loving them and hating them a lot. Then like he has the picture book and like as they grow hated, he's like, oh man, my book is gonna bomb. <laughs> yeah. Also, as soon as Gwen Stacy popped up, I'm like, oh man, she gonna die in this comic, huh? They gonna show that. Yeah, we're gonna that. have to watch it again. We're gonna watch her nick snap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just ah, uh, mm, yeah. You know what? It is one of the greatest moments in comic book history. I think it's very important for Spider Man. I think it's very important for Cummins in general. You know what I'm saying? J j like, like it feel like Cummins was growing up. But yeah. man, if I gotta see Gwen Stacy, Gwen Stacy Nick snap one more damn time. Yeah. <laughs> but look, um, just on that note, I'd like to say I think Amazing Spider-Man. While 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 the Gwen Stacy thing is overused, I think Amazing Spider-Man two handles that death really well. Yeah, the, I thought those movies those movies were fine. Um, look, look to me, there's no such thing as a bad Spider-Man movie. Yeah, that, like 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 that. Well, maybe Spider-Man three. Like it, it's this weird thing with Spider-Man where like I love Spider-Man so much, even if I don't particularly like the story. Mm -hmm. It's always it's always cool to see him swing around and fight villains, if nothing else. 
Also, controversial opinion. Andrew Garfield is my, is my favorite Spider Man. I said. Wow. It. I said. Wow. Look, wow. look, look. We're talking about Marvels. We're not even going. You, you, people can yell. At, you, people can yell about yell, yell at me later. We'll, we'll have that discussion another day <laughs> about Spider Man. But yeah, so so I think we should talk about the art. This yeah. art is a little bit different than Kingdom Comes, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, his his style has always been like Norman Rockwell, like you know what I'm saying? Like, 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 like he's very much like like a Norman Rockwell type artist. This though is really, really Norman Rockwell, even more so than Kingdom Come. It's like he was using a different technique. I'm I'm not for sure. Or it's just that his style, like like you know, changed. I feel like it may I mean to me the biggest thing I noticed was just that there were more panels in this book. And Which, that yeah. there were more that he did smaller illustrations rather than the large spreads that he he was using in some of the other books of his we've read right um so uh, i mean i was perceiving it as just an um as a consequence of working at the smaller scale uh so i wonder is that what he did here like like did, did he did he draw it like a traditional comic and just paint it over it yeah i mean i i guess that's that's what i'm trying to say is that this is more like him trying to squeeze his paintings into a comic book rather than letting his preferred yeah. method dictate what happens in the story. Um, but I don't think that has anything to do with it being, like you said, Norman Rockwell. -y. I was going to say, I feel like the light in here is warmer because the, the thing I said where like, it feels like it's, it feels to me like his illustrations are very static sometimes. Right. And I feel like that comes from having a really clearly defined light source in all of his drawings. Mm -hmm. And I feel like here the light was just warmer than it was in, in his other, in his other books. So it was sort of like a, I don't know if it's like a red for Marvel thing and a blue for DC thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel like it might be that, warmth of light and like the warmth of the images that gives it that sort of timeless Rockwell. Well, not timeless actually like that 1940s, 1950s ish Norman Rockwell feel. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so I want to talk about superhero designs. Okay. Now, like I, I, I want to ask you this. I want to ask you this, but I figured it would be better after we read Marvel's. His art. Who do you, who who do you think it compliments more, Marvel or DC? I I have my own thoughts, but I want to hear yours. Who like as far as superheroes drawn? Does his style seems to fit better with Marvel or DC in your opinion? It's hard for me to say. I feel like I I feel like I like his DC stuff better. Okay, good. Okay, yeah, me too. Me too. I would I would say with one exception though. Okay. His his Silver Surfer, uh -huh. that Silver Surfer cover is like the best thing I've seen ever. <laughs> um, there's there's one cover of the uh, the Silver Surfer, and he's coming out towards he's coming out of the page at you, and you can see the reflections in him of the city below and of the Human Torch like flying back at him, and it's the coolest thing ever. So, like move over Shazam, Silver Surfer flying in here. Well, you know, I have a rule about Silver Surfer comics. The art always must be good. Even if the story is boring or, or, or like not good at all. Mm -hmm. I feel like Silver Surfer is one of those characters that I think needs good art to like It's like he was invented to be drawn cool. Well he like was. they worked backwards. <laughs> yeah, he well he was. <laughs> As we know. Jack yeah. Kirby Jack Kirby just thought of this guy one day. And Stan was like, who the hell is this? He was like, I thought I thought he might need somebody to come there and tell him that he was coming. 
And Stan was like, okay, then I guess we're just gonna roll with this. Like, yeah, he's meant to be drawn cool, and his Silver Surfer is amazing. Now, yeah. it's funny you should say that. I think what the problem is, his, his like, like I said, his style of art, right, is very operatic, is very grand, right? And that fits better with DC and how those costumes are designed, right? Yeah. Marvel, as we know, is more grounded, closer to the earth. You know what I'm saying? Like, still fantastical, but just slightly more realistic, for lack of a better term. Right. And I don't, and I don't think his art works. I don't think that his super realistic style works well with those costumes. You th- you think it should, but it doesn't. Yeah, I feel like. Um... You know, like we talk about, like he uses photo reference and, you know, when he gets somebody in to do like, this is the guy I'm going to draw as Superman. In the drawing, he still makes the guy like still even bigger and stronger than he is in the photo. Right. I feel like for Marvel, he wouldn't do that. So we're really just getting like real people. (laughs) Yeah. and, and, And it's like those costumes don't look quite as good. Like none of it looks bad. You know what I'm saying? But it just. I don't know, it's just weird, like, it just doesn't quite fit, in my opinion. Like, like, soup, uh, like, Spider-Man being able to see, like, the folds in, like, you know, the costume when he bends his arm. Okay, yes, like, there probably are folds in the costume when he bends his arm because it's fabric and he's bending his arm, but, like, I don't need to see that. Yeah. That is, like, extra detail that I don't need, um in the in the illustration all the time and on the dc characters that's sort of like endearing and makes them accessible and makes it feel real and on spider-man it just makes him look more like a kid wearing a costume (laughs) exactly and but yeah see because like it's, it's been bugging me and like i think he's done most of his interior work for dc now if you ask him he said he loved both equally but I just think his style just works. I, I think his operatic style works better with more operatic superheroes like DC. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, his Captain America, his his Green Goblin looked pretty okay, I think. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but yeah, so. It feels, it really feels like Ross trying out ideas in general that, that he's he's got this... Um, all right. So, that, you know, there's, you, you're familiar with this as someone who has displayed their work in an art gallery, right? Y- yes. Yes. There's this, there's this idea that sometimes artists will have a particular concept that they're exploring and that they try to execute it a few different ways and emphasize different parts and that they're just sort of playing around with the same idea over and over again to try and find like the truest expression of, of what they're looking for. Um, So I feel like, I feel like Marvel's and kingdom come are both Alex Ross trying to explore the same idea of what if superheroes were real and what if we didn't unequivocally love them? Right. But I feel like kingdom come is a more complete realization of that idea. Mm, Okay. And that Marvel's is more of like a, I don't want to, Marvel's is even more realistic because real life doesn't have a nice tidy arc to it. Right. Right. So, but I feel like these are both sort of exploring the same concepts and, oh God, it's just, it's so, it's so hard to not compare them. Does that seem too far off base to think of these as like we're walking down an art gallery of comic books? I think, you know what, when you, when you were saying that, this is what I think. I think Alec Ross might have a better understanding of superheroes than we, than we even give him credit for. Oh yeah, definitely. Because here's the thing, right? We talk about how grand, grand Marvel is comparatively to DC, right? That reflects in that reflects in these works, right? Yeah. And, and Kingdom Come 
It's about Superman. It's about Wonder Woman. It's about this giant conflict because that's what DC is about, right? Is is about these superheroes. It is not about the average man. Is is about these superheroes and their problems. Right, and we don't even have an average man just going through his life in a normal way. It's like a supernatural, voyeuristic, enabled time travel plot. Right, but then, nothing about it is nothing about it is normal. Exactly, then, but then we get to Marvel, right? Which again, we said is more grounded. He 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 grounds the story as far as he can by giving us a regular guy. In, in, in these extraordinary times and not even a regular guy like a regular guy who is weird and has irrational inconsistent thoughts and grows up like a normal person does which which is like marvel bread and butter yeah so like maybe he like maybe his genius maybe like we're looking at this wrong maybe it's not maybe well, can, maybe maybe we're just Deep down, maybe we're just DC fans. I mean, you know what? I'm, you know what, Amanda? I'm starting to think that. I don't know how you feel. I, I know you really don't have no allegiance, but like, at this point, we don't really allow books by both. Yeah. I think we, I think if, if I go back and look, I think we enjoyed the DC books more. I think so too. Um, I mean, I mean, there there are exceptions, you know. what I'm saying like 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 Daredevil, and like you know, um, and um, and Dark Phoenix, right? But if you look at it, right, like 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 you know, we didn't like the Ultimates, we didn't like um, we didn't like Infinity Gauntlet, and that's supposed <laughs> to be like the greatest Marvel story ever told, and we were just like, we and we just shit all over that book. <laughs> But then we go back, like, oh yeah, we love the long Halloween. Like, oh yeah, we love Kingdom Come. Like, <laughs> I'm, I, and I'm starting to wonder, like, are we just more aligned? Uh, aligned? Well, know? I've had, I've had a theory about Marvel and DC for a while, which I think is reflected in their comics and their movies. Okay. Which is, Marvel is like very consistent. But averages like a B plus. Right. DC is all over the place, which means sometimes you get like A plus plus extra credit, and sometimes you get like dumpster fire. What did you even turn in for this assignment? Like horrible crap. So I think the I think what's going on is that we're comparing like the the some of the like best marvel stuff which is still only going to be like an a against the best of dc which is genre defining um but i think that like and this is actually this is a this is a fundamental question in statistics called bayesian analysis um if anyone wants to look that up but there's two questions you can ask which are very different one is is dc better or is marvel better and it's like, okay, well, on average, they're the same. But if you ask me, do I want to read a Marvel book next or a DC book next? I can count on the Marvel book being good enough. The DC book, I may have no idea. Right? Or, like, if you ask me, like, which movie do I want to go see next? I'm going to be like, hey, all of the Marvel movies are pretty good. A couple of them were really great, and a couple of them were stupid. The DC movies are like, who knows what I'm going to get. But then, but then when DC hit it out the park. Yeah. It, like, like, I mean, I know we were both lukewarm on Joker, but everybody seems to love that movie, right? And, mm -hmm. like, like, clearly it's something different, right? It, like, <laughs> so when they hit it out the park. Yeah, it is is the bit like like you know like okay everybody loves Engage everybody loves the Winter Soldier. Yeah, but but is it the Dark Knight? Like, <laughs> right. So so those are the two questions which are different. One is which one is better overall, and then the other question is what do you want to read or watch next? Um, I also use Nicolas Cage as an example of this. Like mm. overall, Nicolas Cage, great actor. Do you want to watch his next movie? Probably not, because recently he's been doing crap, right? Like, like, like you, like you need to hear first if it's good or not. Like, you need to hear, 
Like, right, right. So when you there, there are two different questions, and I think um, I think it's really interesting when you meet people and you ask them like, "What's your favorite comic book hero?" To also ask them, "Well, what do you feel like reading right now?" Because they're very different things. And like I know, just like and, and this has happened. I've noticed like in the last few years. Like, like to me, I think what makes you a fan more of, of one company than the other, if 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 you want to enjoy reading a B tier characters, right? Mm, and like, yeah. and like, I have to say, I think I enjoy reading DC B tier characters more than I love reading Marvel like B tier characters. Okay. Like, like you know, everybody reads Spider Man, right? You know what I'm saying? Everybody reads Spider Man. You know, X Men when it's good, everybody reads X Men, right? But like. Are you gonna read like that? Um, I don't know. Are, are you really gonna read that Miss Marvel book? I mean, I know Miss Marvel does well, but do you do you really want to read the Miss Marvel book, or do you want to read like the Super Sons book with with Damian Wayne and um, Jonathan Kent? <laughs> and like both are good, right? Like there's nothing wrong with either or. You know what I'm saying? Just which one would you rather read? And I'm like, I'm probably gonna read the Super Sons book. Uh, I think that's another good question to ask. Man, the people who work at my local comic book store are gonna get they're gonna get drilled this weekend when I go in. <laughs> you should record it and, and we should put it on the show. I think this you know what? I think we should explore this like in another episode. Cause like I think yeah. we, I think this is a really interesting question to like answer. Like I think like like I'm looking through like our list of shows that we done now. Like oh we like that, we didn't like this, we like that, we didn't like this so much. But yeah, so damn it, Amanda, we just all off topic. We're not even talking about the book anymore. No, that's fine. <laughs> Some of our favorite books are the ones that made us ask each other questions about our lives. Right. Like like the Raina Telgemeier book. Which which was very. Good. Man, I see her books every damn where. Yeah. Everywhere, like, like, like I'm like I, I went to like ten targets um this past weekend looking for um um an uh, action figure because you know I'm a 35 year old man I figured that was the best thing to do with my family was to go to ten different targets but um like everywhere we everywhere we went I just seen her books everywhere I just like I was like I, I almost bought a couple just cause like I really like her I really enjoy her stuff anyway so back to this book. Yeah. So, um, I want to talk about the Fantastic Four for a second, right? Okay. So, I've always had this problem. This is not a problem, but, like, to me, the Fantastic Four always exists in 1962 and the modern day at the exact same time. And this book doesn't help with that, right? Because, like, I associate the Fantastic Four with the space race so closely in my mind, right? Yeah. That, like, so, like, in my mind, right, it, it happens like this. When everything before they go up in the rocket ship happens in 1962, then as soon as they come back down, it's modern day. Like, I know that makes no sense, but, like, there's such a 60 atomic age concept, and mm -hmm. they really haven't escaped those trappings in all these years. That, for me, is always weird. In my mind, it's always hard to picture them, like, in the modern day, like... I read a comment that retold their origin, right? And they said, oh, yeah, we went up in the rocket ship in, like, 2008. And I'm like, no, you didn't. Like, <laughs> but, no, that makes, I, sense. that makes sense, though. Of course, they would go up in 2008 because it's a sliding timeline. But in my mind, they always, no matter the year, no matter mm -hmm. who, the year it take place in, they always go up in that rocket ship in, like, 1962. <laughs> See, I was going to make the joke that maybe the reason why it seems implausible is that, like, we haven't quite invested in our space program the same way. Right. Like, we don't get excited for shuttle launches anymore. We actually, we don't even really have a shuttle program right now. Like, we should, it should feel <laughs> like they shouldn't have been on a rocket launch. They should have been, like, leaving mars for a deep space like mining mission in the asteroid belt or something right exactly but because because our world is falling apart and we have other things to worry about i guess we don't really we don't have moon bases we we don't go to space the same way so so okay so what you're saying is since since, since our rocket program haven't progressed in 50 years 
That's why I'm having such a hard time trying to pit the Fantastic Four. Yeah. And, and, and their voice into space in the modern context. Yeah, that's I'm I'm not it's it's not only that, but I think it's a little bit that is that just in general, you say the word astronaut to me. And I immediately think like 1960s, like Apollo missions. I am not thinking about anything happening in real life right now. And that includes my husband worked for NASA. And I still don't associate anything he did with like the modern space program. Look, look, you know, I was about to ask you, right? Mm -hmm. did, did he wear a white shirt with a thin tie and, and, and like dark rim glasses? Because that's what that's, that's what all them dudes wore back then. No, no, but my <laughs> my father my father is an engineer and he definitely dressed like that in like the early nineties. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Did did you ever see the movie um by Neil Armstrong with um with, with Ryan Gosling? No. Uh what is it? The the one that came out last year. It's really good. But okay. it, but yeah, but again, everybody's dressed like that in that movie and I just think it's hilarious. Like even the astronauts when they're not astronauting are dressed, <laughs> are dressed um, like that. All right, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to wrap this back into the book so we can. Uh, yeah, we yeah. Can wrap it, okay. <laughs> um, really great use of clothing throughout. We talked a little bit about how the costumes for the superheroes were maybe a little disappointing because they were too real, but like the changing clothing style to show the changing of time and the different hairstyles for the women. I think Ross did a lot of really good research there to make it feel, um, you know, to make those details so realistic that you don't even notice them, but they help a lot. Yeah, yeah, um, just like the passage of time. Passage of time. I, yeah, I really do appreciate that because, like, he doesn't does he doesn't do it in the hack way, right? Like, you could almost not pay attention that time is pants pass it but if you pay attention you can see it because like um what you call it he's he, he's visibly getting older yep but it's, but it's very subtle you know what i'm saying so, so sometimes he gets older within the same book yeah um you can also see like his camera equipment changes yes over, um and his the style of his glasses changes it's just um, I feel like that was probably so much fun for him to research. You you know what I appreciate, and you may not notice this, is how much his wife changes. Mm -hmm. Like, like you know, like in the forest, she's like a really hot young thing, for yeah. lack of a better for lack of a better term. But by the time you get to the sixties, she's like she's put on a little weight. You know what I'm saying? Her hair's a little gray, a little bit. She looks she looks like a mom, but it's yeah. the same lady. Like uh, it just it, I just think that's really cool. Well, and I think part of him being able to do that is that, you know, if he gets someone for photo reference, he can actually ask for their childhood photos. Right. So, you know, it's it's difficult to sometimes imagine what someone would look like older or younger. But if he actually has the photos to reference, like I love when they do that in movies, when they, you know, they get like you just mentioned him, Ryan Gosling, like let's say like they get one of his baby photos and use it. In the background, so it seems more realistic. Um, they do that with the Rock a lot, since Rock is usually playing like some big meathead. Well, I won't yeah. say meathead, but like they use all his football photos. Mm -hmm. Like it's it just him, like in high school. Did you know the Rock was like six four and a half at, at, at like fourteen years old? My goodness. Yeah, I know, right? Just it's not fair. Okay, genetics are just not fair. I just, I just. Want to, <laughs> I just want to put that out there. But yeah. It's also not fair. I'm trying to keep us on topic and wrap this up, and you got to go bring in The Rock. You like The Rock? You like? Of course, you're a woman. No, I'm not trying to stereotype, but it, of course, you like The Rock. Everybody, everybody likes The Rock. Look, I'm kind of gay for The Rock. Everybody loves The Rock. Okay. I like The Rock. I wish I wish that he let himself be the butt of jokes a little bit more. You, you, you don't think he is? You don't think he does that? I think he does it better than some... There's some action heroes do. He does. He definitely does it better than some. Um, but I remember we actually saw the Baywatch movie. Right. And he ruined it. And he what? He ruined it. Really? Like that movie, it looks like someone went through the script for that movie and said, you can't make any jokes about The Rock. Like he can't, nothing stupid can happen to him. He can't look stupid. He can't, nothing. So, really, you know, it, yeah. Ain't no way. He always seemed like he had such a good sense of humor about those type of things. He always seemed like he was. I feel like I feel like in a lot of things he 
I feel like in a lot of things he does, and like you said, especially better than a lot of action heroes, but I feel like he could stand to like let himself not look so cool every now and then. You know what, man? We are completely off topic. I think we should wrap this up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Amanda, tried. You tried. It just don't, don't mean it'll work. So, Amanda, would you recommend Marvels? Yes. Yes, I would. But not... Uh, not as highly as Alex Ross's other work. If you had to choose, this is not the first thing I would have you read of his. You know what? I I I I I, I will I will contradict you and say this: you should absolutely read this first because since it's the first thing he did, it literally gets better. We we read it backwards, and I and I think maybe since we read it backwards, mm-hmm. it had a negative effect on this book. But if you start from this book, okay. And if we're, you know, if you start with this, then read Kingdom Come. You can see a progression in, in his art and like his scale with the storytelling yeah. and everything. Yeah. So, Amanda, if they want to talk to us about Ellis Ross, where could they reach us? We are on Twitter as Comic Book Club Fifty Two. They can also email us at comicbookclub52 at gmail dot com, and we are on Facebook as the Comic Book Club. And you can also find us personally on social media as well. Yes. So, um, Amanda, what are we reading um, next time? We are doing Astro City next time. Yes, we are. So, this has been a pretty good episode. Um, We'll wrap it up here. I'm Jamil Payne. I'm Amanda Comey. And we are out. Bye.